Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Trastan and Atira, um lecture um, being hosted by Peter McCabe um, called The Final Resting Places of 20 Sporting Legends from Throughout Northern Ireland. Um, this is Peter's uh, second uh, lecture with us tonight, and um, he's a Belfast based tour guide with experience of leading walking tours, especially around East Belfast and a range of local cemeteries as well as on the city sightseeing tourist buses. To date, Peter has also written four books detailing people buried in a myriad of cemeteries in Belfast and beyond. Peter also looks after the um, childhood home of George Best, which just happens um, to have been um, his previous talk, which you can actually find on uh, YouTube. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, the form part of the presentation if you want to pop it into the chat box and uh, we'll put it to Peter at the end of the presentation. So I'll hand it over to you now, Peter, and uh, thanks to everyone. Enjoy. Thanks very much, Marianne. Um, so this talk as well, I'll just, sorry, I'll just, yeah. This talk, sorry, thanks very much, Marianne. Um, this talk is also from the George Best Childhood Home and uh, so it's where I can have good access to Wi-Fi. So as we said, this is uh, this talk is going to be about the final resting places of 20 sporting legends from throughout Northern Ireland. So we've tried to make it across a range of sports, but we have uh, eight footballers, two rugby players, two boxers, two rally drivers, a golfer, um, a motorcyclist, a uh, Sam McGuire winner, a snooker player, a cyclist, and an ex Mr. Universe. We try to make it across uh, as much of Northern Ireland as possible. So we've got um, a few, we've got one in Straban, Ballymoney, Portrush, Eglish, and County Tyrone, up to Derry, uh, as well as a few in some place called Belfast. So I'll rattle through them, and uh, there's quite a number of slides. So I'll give it a blast. So there's 20 of them, and they're in date order for Mer. And uh, so first one is this one. This is in Belfast City Cemetery. <clears throat> this is the fa family grave of John Pedden. So he was a footballer, and this is John Pedden here, known as Jack. But he began his career with Linfield as a 21-year-old in 1886. In 1893, he became the first Irish player to play for Manchester United. They were then called Newton Heath. He then left the Heath, their nickname was the Heathens, at the end of the 1893-1894 season to join Sheffield United. He then returned to Ireland to play for Distillery. He finally joined Linfield in, again in 1898 before retiring at the end of that season. He made 24 appearances and scored seven goals for Ireland in a 12-year international career. Jack Pitten died on 15th September 1984, aged 80. So this is a little plaque on his grave in Belfast City Cemetery. It's been put in relatively recently. Um, you can see he's commemorated there as the first Irish footballer to play in the English League for Manchester United. Um, and he also played, there's no other teams that he played for. So Jack Pedden was inducted, as you can see from the base of that headstone, inducted into the IFA, Irish Football Association Hall of Fame in 2005. So the next one, sorry, that's, uh, that shows you a Linfield representative uh, at his grave uh, with a couple of his uh, international caps. This is the next one. This is down into Movilla Cemetery in Newton Ards. And this is uh, this man, Blair Main. He's commemorated on the headstone here as Lieutenant Colonel Robert Blair Main, DSO Distinguished Service Order, Three Bars, Legion to Honour, Croix de Guerre, died 14th December uh, 1955. And he was 40 when he died. So Blair Main is perhaps best known in this capacity as a founding member of the S Special Air Service, the SAS. During the course of the Second World War, he became one of the British Army's 
most highly decorated soldiers, but was controversially denied at Victoria Cross. This is a talk about sportsmen, but Blair, so Blair Main uh, is perhaps less well known uh, for his exploits on the rugby pitch. So this is Blair Main uh, playing uh, before a game for Ireland. The 23-year-old 20, Blair Main had a bright future ahead of him in rugby until fate in the form of the Second World War II intervened. Main had attended Regent House Grammar School in New Norwich and he played for the first school first 15 in our rugby football club. Whilst at Queen's University in Belfast studying law, he took up boxing and won the Irish University's heavyweight title in August 1936. He made his Ireland rugby debut against Wales at Ravenhill, not too far from where I am now, George Best House, in 1937. and was only capped three times before he was selected for the Lions Tour to South Africa. The tour lasted from June to September 1938, encompassing 24 matches. Whilst the Lions lost the Test Series 2-1, their victory in the third game was the first Test winner for the Lions in seven, uh, a record Test score for them and their first win against South Africa since 1910. Blair performances made a big impression with one match report describing how he played with ruthless efficiency, covering the ground at an extraordinary speed for a man of his build, as, as many a three-quarter and full-back have discovered. Harry McKibben, who was another member of that 1938 tour, spoke uh, and said about the huge role uh, Blair Main played. He, he was a colossus, physically strong and imposing, and back then there were not as many huge rugby players. So this is Blair Main uh, with, uh, he's at the top there, uh, fifth from the right, uh, playing for, uh, posing with his Irish um, teammates. And then this is Blair Main again at the back in the middle um, with the, in the British Lions Tour in 1938. <clears throat> Sadly, Blair Main died in a car accident and uh, in uh, 1955, aged only 40. So bronze statue of Blair Main stands in Conway Square in Eaton Arts, which is the Western by bypass of the town near his childhood home, Mount Pleasant, is also named in his honour. A number of books have been written about Blair Main, the first being called Colonel Paddy. So say so he's well known, uh, certainly locally, uh, for being a founding member of the SAS, but less well known is his prowess on the rugby pitch and also as a boxer. This is the third one then. This is back into the city cemetery in Belfast. And this is the final resting place of another footballer, a goalkeeper, Elisha Scott. He was associated with Liverpool Football Club for a record-breaking 22 years. He played a major part in their back-to-back -back championship winning teams of 1922 and 23. He missed just three games of the first title and none of the second, making the last of his 467 appearances against Chelsea on 21st February 1934. So you might be able to see just to the right of the screen there the, the um, Liverpool crest on uh, Elisha Scott's headstone, but also on the left, you'll see the Belfast Celtic uh, crest. So he was the last manager of Belfast Celtic, and the club won 10 Irish League titles, six Irish Cups, three City Cups, eight Gold Cups, and five County Anthem Shields during Elisha, during Elisha Scott's time at the helm. So he died 16th May 1959, as you'll see there on his headstone. Well, Lisa Scott, this is his photograph here, sorry, and uh, definitely a, uh, an absolute Liverpool legend. So this is across the road in, from the city cemetery, this is over in Milltown, a Roman Catholic cemetery, and this is another footballer. This is the very famous Charlie Tully. So you'll see there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a number of items at his final resting place. So that's his headstone. Sacred to the memory of my dear husband and our dear father, Charles Patrick Tully, Celtic FC in Ireland. So he was the darling of the Hoops fans for over a decade and his cheeky approach to football uh, has made him one of the best loved Celtic icons of all time. He moved to Parkhead in June 1948 from his hometown side, Belfast Celtic, where he had been idolized by the home support. 
His journey across the Irish Sea for, then, for a then sizable fee of £8,000 triggered a frenzied response from fans in Glasgow. There's a strong case for claiming that Charlie Tully was really the first celebrity footballer long before the arrival of George Best, David Beckham, etc. When he left Celtic in the summer of 1959 to join Cork Hibs, he played 319 times for Celtic, <clears throat> scored 43 goals. He won just one league title at Celtic, won two Irish, two Scottish Cups, sorry, and two League Cups. On the international front, Charlie Tully was capped 11 times by Northern Ireland. And the Belfast boy, as he was known, B H O Y boy, died on 27th July 1971. So there's a little plaque on his headstone that commemorates his connection with Belfast Celtic. You'll see there he's remembered <clears throat> as, Char as Cheeky Charlie. And then this is a, a, a plaque, sorry, uh, some flowers, artificial flowers that are put on his head, uh, on his grave relatively recently, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of his passing. And this is a further plaque on his grave. This is an image of Charlie Tully with uh, one of the um, Scottish Cups that he won. And then uh, there's a book by Tom Campbell called Charlie Tully, Celtics Tiki Chappie. So the next one is also, oh, sorry, this is, uh, this is um, Charlie Tully's um, funeral. So I think the man to on the, on the right at the front is possibly very old. The man behind him is definitely Jock Steen and the, man, the late Jock Steen. And then the man behind him is also the late um, Billy McNeil. So the next person is also a footballer, but in this case, it's a lady footballer. And this is over to the north side of Belfast for this one. This is... Um, in St Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery at Green Castle. This is the final resting place of Molly Seaton, commemorated here as Big Molly. She was known as Dandy Street's answer to George Best. She was born in Green Castle in North Belfast in 1905. She lived at Dandy Street, not far from the docks, and she worked in Belfast linen mills. Tall and very strong. And that's um, Molly leading the team out there. Um, she became a noted uh, footballer, famous for her hard tackling, and uh, formed a local woman's team, Castle Rovers, and was a star player for them. Molly Seaton gained celebrity status in Belfast football, known for her strong personality as well as her dominance on the pitch. She played for many different teams and in an exhibition games organised by Glenn Torrance. She captained the Ireland team against teams from England, Scotland and France. In 1927, she joined the best team in Scotland, Rother Glen Ladies. She knew her worth, and when Castle Rovers played her, paid her 10 shillings a game, and she even had her own agent, Joe Farrell, who arranged for her to feature in newspaper advertisements aimed at female readers. Known for her liking of tobacco and beer, Molly was often to be seen in local pubs. But after the 1930s, she faded to the margins of history and died 12th January 1974. It's only relatively recently that public interest in her story has rev re revived thanks to the likes of Steve Bolton and also Tara uh, O'Neill's, Caroline O'Neill's Rough Girls play on BBC Four. And this is an uh, advert for, uh, for, for Rough Girls. Um, I certainly wouldn't argue with a few of those uh, ladies. So that's the type, that's the era that um, Molly Seaton was gaining her uh, formidable reputation. Another lady that was also part of that um, era was a lady called Selena, known as Sis um, Ellison. And she was a very good footballer. She captained Bloomfield ladies team in, in East Belfast. But she, she was quite a good footballer, but after she got married, she, she packed the football in, but she had two, and she after she married John Blanchflower, and so that, and she had two very well-known footballing sons, um, Danny and the often forgotten Jackie Blanchflower. 
So the next one is a boxer, and it's back over again to the city cemetery. And this is Rinty Monaghan. On his retirement in 1950, Rinty Monaghan's trophy cabinet contained the British, European, Commonwealth, and World Crowns. You'll see at the bottom of the headstone, he's commemorated there as undefeated world flyweight champion. That means he, he, um, he didn't lose his title, but he did suffer a number of defeats during his uh, his career. The 66 official bouts he fought uh, during his illustrious career, he won 51, drew six and lost nine. He endeared himself to his supporters by singing when Ari's eyes were smiling after each bout. After retirement, he became a part-time cabaret artist. He toured Western Europe with other notables of the period, such as Vera Lynn, Gracie Fields and George Formby, Formby and later formed his own band. His nickname, Rinty, came from his fondness of dogs, regularly bringing home injured dogs, so often that his grandmother called him Rin Tin Tin after the film dog and shortened it to Rinty. Rinty Monon died on 3rd March 1984, he's 65, and a number of years, well, relatively recently, there is a, there is a statue erected in it used to be called Boy Square in, uh, in Belfast, near, near, near the popular um, cathedral quarter. So this depicts Rindy Monaghan singing an Irish eyes are smiling after one of his uh, successful bouts, usually um, and mo most notably at the King's Hall. So the next one then is a champion golfer. We're back, we're up to Port Rush, a cemetery called Bally Willen in Port Rush. And you can see there, this is the final resting place of Fred Daly, OBE, British Open golf champion, 1947. And this is Fred Daly here. <clears throat> He's born 11th October, 1911. And he was best known for winning the Open Championship in 1947 at the Royal Liverpool Golf Club at Hoylake. He was born in Port Rush, County Antrim, and he was the first Irish man from either side of the border to win the Open and the first to play in the Ryder Cup. He remained the only Irish winner of the Open until Podrick Harrington won it in 2007. And he was only Northern Irish, Northern Irish major winner until Graham McDowell uh, won the US Open in 2010. Fred Daly died on 18th November. 1990, age 79. Back in the Belfast again, this is Roselawn Cemetery, the same um, graveyard where George Best is buried. You might be able to see at the bottom of the, the, the head, this particular headstone, it commemorates Mervyn Cotter, died 14th May 1998. This is Mervyn Cotter here. He was born and raised in East Belfast, and he worked for Harlan and Wolf Shipyard as a boiler maker. In his spare time, he trained to tone his muscular frame for bodybuilding competitions. In 1952, he won three league, three titles, Mr. Northern Ireland, Mr. Great Britain Health and Strength, and the prestigious Mr. Universe. A story was told of how um, Cotter, used, his trademark was to lift his Norton motorbike above his head to prove his strength. Cotter married his wife Geraldine in 1957 and was survived by her and their three children and six grandchildren when he died on 14th May 1998, age 70. So you wouldn't guess that uh, there's no reference to um, Mervyn Cotter's interesting life from his headstone, uh, but a gentleman called Gill, who used to work at uh, Roselawn, uh, told me about this guy, so I'm indebted to him. Um, so that's the, I think, quite remarkable uh, Mervyn Cotter. The next one is over to Straban, west of Northern Ireland, and this commemorates Adrian Doherty. He's commemorated as a beloved son and brother, died 9th June 2000, aged 24 years. And the base of the headstone says, forever in our hearts. Adrian Doherty was uh, born 10th June 1973, and he was a winger for Manchester United. Once hailed as a prodigious talent and a contemporary of the class of 92, on the 23rd of February 1991, a week before Alex Ferguson 
uh, had planned to give Doherty his first team debut. He suffered a cruciate ligament injury while playing in a reserve game against Carlisle United, an injury that would end his Man United career. In early 1982, uh, he went to New York and he did a bit of, he, he performed in a bander called McHillbilly in the hope of landing a record deal. He then, after he retired from football, he made a few appearances for his local club, Derry City. Um, he then, uh, he worked in, in England and Ireland before in 2000, he took up work for a Dutch furniture company in La Hague. Sadly, on 7th May 2000, Doherty was found unconscious in a canal in La Hague. He spent more than a month in a coma in hospital before dying on 9th June, a day before his 27th birthday. There were no drugs in his system and his death was ruled by a Dutch police to be accidental. So you'll see there, uh, he's described as, Adrian Doherty's described as Manchester United's lost star. And he's also, um, they're recorded there as better than Beckham gigs and schools. So um, apparently he was to get into the team, as, as I mentioned there earlier, um, when he got the cruciate ligament injury, then uh, a guy called Ryan Wilson got his place. Ryan Wilson then changed his name to Ryan Giggs. So that's a tra tra very tragic uh, tale about Adrian Doherty. There's a book by, written by this gentleman called Oliver Kay, and you can see it's, it's, it's been nominated as a sports book of the year a number, number of years ago. But it's the story of Adrian Doherty, football's lost genius. And then Ryan Giggs describes him there as incredible. So I've read the book. And uh, it is very uh, powerful stuff. So we're back, we're up to uh, Gary Duff Presbyterian Church, uh, just outside Balamoney in County Antrim. And this is the, uh, this is the final resting place of Joey Dunlop. You might be able to see in the background there, there's also the final resting place of Robert Dunlop. I'm going to talk about Joey first, though. That's a close up of his headstone, and you can see that he's coming right there. William Joseph, known as Joey O B A M B A, died 2nd July 2000, aged 48 years. The lost achievements included three hat tricks at the Isle of Man TT in 1985, 88, and 2000, when he, and he won a record 26 races in total. So a curve at the 26th milestone on the Isle of Man TT circuit is named in Joy Dunlop's honour. During his career, he won uh, the Ulster Grand Prix 24 times. In 1986, won a fifth consecutive TT Formula One world title. He was awarded the MBA in 1986 for his services, services to the sport of uh, motorcycling. In 1986, he was awarded the OBA for his humanitarian work for children in Romanian or orphanages to which he had delivered uh, clothing and food. Lop died in Tallinn in Estonia on 2nd July 2000 while leading a 125cc race. He'd already won the, the 750 and 600cc events pre that previously. He appeared to lose control of his bike in the wet conditions and died instantly on impact with trees. There's Joey Dunlop there in his, uh, in his prime. And there's the scene of his uh, sad demise over in Estonia. In 2016, Joey Dunlop was voted through Motorcycle News as the fifth greatest motorcycling icon ever. Sadly, as local folks will know, um, tragedy then followed the Dunlop family. And then, so behind uh, the Joey's grave is his brother, uh, Robert. He was born on 25th um, November 1960. He was Joey's younger brother. And he was also the, the father to William and Michael Dunlop. Robert Dunlop's first win was at four in County Westmeath in 1980. And two years later, he won one to five CC race at the Mid Antrim. Uh, 150. He was outstanding on a, two, a 125cc bike. At the peak of his career, he dominated the class for two consecutive years, 
defeating all challengers at the Northwest 200, Ulster Grand Prix, and the Isle of Man TT in 1991. <clears throat> Pardon me. 1994, Robert suffered a crash, crash and would end his uh, chance of fulfilling his potential as a world champion. It was two years before he raced again. <laughs> Robert's last major win was at the Northwest 200 in 2006. This is his 15th victory at the circuit, and he remains the most successful rider at the Triangle. Tragically, it was also at the Triangle of, of the Northwest 200 that Robert was killed during practice on uh, Thursday, 15th May, 2008. His nickname was the Mighty Micro, and that's on his headstone. Up at Gary Duff. It's a ball of money. Also buried in the in Gary Duff is um, Robert's son, the eldest son, William. I haven't been able to find his grave. It's, he doesn't seem to be with his father. Couldn't quite quite work out where he is. But he was uh, William was Robert's eldest son. He started racing one two five bikes in two thousand when he was aged only fifteen. During his racing career, he accumulated one hundred and eight. Irish National Road Race wins. In addition, he also achieved four victories at Northwest 200 and seven at the Ulster Grand Prix. He also completed and competed sorry, in 11 TT race set seasons between 2006 and 2017. Sadly, William died in crash during practice at the Scaries 100 in County Dublin on 7th July 2018. His brother, Michael, continues to compete. So Michael has lost his brother, his father, and his his uh, uncle, Joey, uh, but continues to race. So that's his lumps. The next one, I don't have actually have a, head, a photograph of the headstone, but this uh, is down in Cragan Cemetery in Ballon Mallard. So it's a couple of photographs of Cragan. This is where this man is buried, Barry Fisher. He was born on 21st March 1950. He was a very successful rally driver and also a successful businessman. He, four times he won the Irish Tarmac Rally Championship in 1990, 92, 93, and 96. Freddie Fisher also managed to win the 1985-1986 Ulster Rally as a guest entry, beating the likes of the British Championship contenders such as Gwendoff Evans and Alistair McRae. So this is uh, a few photographs over the years of uh, Bertie Fisher in action. I think those are two Ford cars. But he died sadly on, uh, along with his daughter, Emma, and son, Mark, who was also a young up-and-coming rally driver in a helicopter crash on 22nd January 2001, whilst returning from a family trip to Ashford Castle in County Mayo. His wife Gladys and son Roy survived the crash, which is incredible when you see the mess of that uh, helicopter. So that's the late great Bertie Fisher. Also buried in Craigan Cemetery in Valle Mallard is this man, and uh, Bishop Brian Hannon. But he's perhaps well best known for his celebrity son, who is Neil Hannon out of the Pop Combo, uh, Divine Comedy. The next one is down to St. Patrick's Church in Eglish, County Tyrone, and it commemorates Cormac McAnallum. And he's commemorated there as from living, for, born in 1980, died in 2004. He was a successful Gaelic footballer who played for the Eglish St. Patrick's Club and the Tyrone County team. With Tyrone, he won the All-Ireland Senior Football Championship in 2003 and twice won both the Ulster Senior Football Championship and National League titles. At underage level, he won an All-Ireland Minor and two All-Ireland Under-21 Championships with Tyrone. He also won an All-Stars Award for his performances in the 2003 Championship. When he, play, when he study, was studying at uh, UCD, he, he played for UCD and helped the university win the Dublin Senior Football Championship. Herbert Martin Allen died suddenly on 
2nd March 2004, aged only 24. Despite his short career, he won almost every honour in the game and was also known as a particularly inspirational captain. Conrad McInnell's family still keep his memory alive um, and he's certainly in Tyrone, he's a, he's a legend. The next one is up, back up to Belfast to the city cemetery. It's hard to get a good photograph of this uh, headstone as I have proved in this photograph. There's a bit of a close up there and you may be able to see at the bottom of the screen, it commemorates Ronald, G Ronald James Adams, died 13th April, 2004, aged 88. This is Ronnie Adams here in the middle. And he was one of the last gentleman rally drivers in 1936, he won the first circuit of Ireland Valley whilst driving an Austin uh, 16 sports saloon. He also won the 1956 Monte Carlo Rally whilst driving a heavyweight Jaguar Mark 7 saloon. Also, Adams also sailed competitively in Dragon Class dinghies and took up classic motorsport in later life, driving MGA and Daimler Dart sports cars. Mentioned earlier, earlier he died on 12th April 2004, aged 88. This is George Best's final resting place. This is at Roseland Cemetery, Cemetery just outside Belfast. And you can see there's a number of items that people leave around George's grave there. This is George here. <coughs> Born on 22nd May 1946, he's regarded as possibly the greatest footballer of all time. Spent most of his club career at Manchester United, where he won the European Cup. He was named the European Footballer of the Year in 1968. He was also capped 37 times for Northern Ireland between 1964 and 1977. With his good looks and playboy lifestyle, he became one of the first media celebrity footballers, earning the nickname L. Beatle, or he was referred to as the fifth Beatle on occasions. Sadly, his extravagant lifestyle led to personal problems, most notably alcoholism, alcoholism, from which he suffers for the rest of his life. Best said of his career, I spent a lot of money on booze, birds, in other words, women, and fast cars. The rest I just wandered. After football, he spent some time as a football analyst, dying in 2005 after receiving a liver transplant uh, three years previously in 2002. George was predeceased by his mother, Annie Mary Best, who died 12th October 1978. He's only 56, and his father to the right here, uh, Richard, known as Dickie, died on 16th April 2008, aged 88. So that photograph is taken in this, this room that I'm sitting in. Um, Also, this is another photograph of George, and the man to George's right, your left, is Bob Bishop. He was the man who's credited with discovering George Best. He sent a telegram to Matt, Sir Matt Busby, which the telegram just said, I think I found you a genius. So um, this is Bob Bishop, and he's buried not too far from, uh, from George. Uh, you see it. He's commemorated there in the middle, Robert Hooper. Uh, sorry, Robert Bishop, Paul Bishop, died 13th June 1990. So we're back over to Milltown Cemetery uh, off the Falls Road for another boxer. This is John Caldwell. You can see he's commemorated in the headstone as an Irish boxing legend, died 10th July. 2009, age 71. Based on the headstone says rest in peace, and then the very bottom says world champion. And then but there's an image of John Caldwell to the right of the headstone, on the, on the headstone, and also the, the five rings of the Olympics. He was born on 7th May 1938 in Belfast. He won the bronze medal in the flyweight, in other words, 51 kilogram division at the 1956 Summer Olympics, which are in Melbourne in Australia. He was considered a supreme fighter 
whose class and skill also saw him claim the world bantamweight crown in 1961. During his magnificent career as an amateur and a professional, in which he contested uh, 275 bouts, he won on all but 10 occasions. So he won 265 fights and only lost 10 as an uh, amateur and then a professional. There's Caldwell pictured there as an amateur, and then that's him in later life. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, he died age 71 on 10th July 2009. But like Randy Monaghan, there is now a statue quite close uh, to uh, Milltown where John Caldwell's buried. And this is at Dunville Park, which is off the Falls Road near, near um, the Royal Victoria Hospital. It's quite nice that John Caldwell and, both, and Randy Monaghan are both remembered uh, through, through these statues. So over to Carn Money, which is North Belfast. And this is the final resting place of, you'll see at the base of the headstone, Alex the Hurricane Higgins, devoted father and brother, died 24th July 2010. You'll see then a little plaque in front, and that commemorates Alex Hurricane Higgins, world champion 1972 and 1982, and he's referred to there as the People's Champion. Alex Higgins was born on 18th March 1949. He's remembered as one of the most iconic figures of snooker. As well as winning the World Championship twice, he was runner-up in 1976 1980. <clears throat> Higgins also won the UK Championship in 1983 and the Masters in 1978 and 1981, making him one of uh, 11 players to have completed Snooker's Triple Crown. He also won the World Cup three times with the, uh, the Snooker World Cup with the All-Ireland team. He was first diagnosed with throat cancer in 1998, and he died of multiple, multiple causes in his Belfast home, aged only 60, 61. So Alex was a sorry sight, as you can see from this uh, photograph of him in his uh, latter years. That's Alex Higgins. And over to um, Victoria Cemetery, which is in Carrickfergus, in County Antrim. This is the final resting place of Ben Robinson. He's commemorated as a truly amazing son and brother, forever loved and sorely missed by all. <clears throat> ben Robinson, so this is the photograph that's on, on his headstone is this one. He was age, age only 14 when he died. He was the first person in Northern Ireland recognised to have died from what, what is no, now known as second impact syndrome, having been sent back into action in a junior rugby match between the school, Carrick Fergus Grammar <clears throat> and Dalriata. Del dead for a further 25 minutes after sustaining a severe blow to the head during the match on 29th January 2011. The teenager died of his injuries two days later in the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast. In 2016, Ben's parents began legal action for negligence against a host of rugby organisations, the first case of its kind in Northern Ireland, concerning a death due to second impact syndrome. According to Ben's father, Peter, there were numerous opportunities for those in charge to notice that Benjamin had suffered se several concussive type head injuries and therefore the coach of the schoolboy rugby team and the referee should have been aware or should have had the means of being aware that concussion is dangerous and can could result in death. Thankfully now the dangers of concussion are, are widely acknowledged in a range of contact sports including rugby and then increasingly football. So a little plaque at the base of the headstone and it commemorates Ben as awesome, loving, vibrant. That's 14-year-old um, Ben Robinson. He died in the rugby, well, as a result of injuries on the rugby pitch. Up to um, Derry, Stroke Londonderry City Cemetery now uh, for this one. And this 
is Captain Fantastic. This is Ryan McBride. You'll see he's commemorated there uh, about the middle of the, the headstone is for the Derry City logo. Uh, Ryan, in brackets, Derry City Captain, died 19th March 2017, is 27 years. This is Captain Fantastic here. He was found dead at his Brandywell home the day after he had led his side to a 4 0 League of Ireland win over Drogheda United. Hundreds of people, including President of Ireland, where Michael D. Higgins packed the family church St. Columbus Long Tower, which overlooks the Candy Stripes Brandywell Stadium for his funeral service. In an emotional poem, then Derry City manager Kenny Shields told those gathered. Um, we love you with all our heart, all of our heart. In your absence, we will all play the game. But in your absence, we will play. Adding that Ryan was a perfect example of it to any young player coming through. Since his debut in 2011, McBride had been a mainstay of the defence and a fan's favourite. He made more than 170 appearances for the Candy Stripes, more than 50 of them as captain. So Ryan was buried alongside his mother. You might have noticed her on the headstone there, Noreen. And the Brandywell Stadium is now where Derry City play their home matches is now called the Ryan McBride uh, Brandywell Stadium. So Derry City fans still continue to sing about Ryan McBride to this day. Um, I know because I saw them playing recently against Bohemians in Dublin and they were singing the song about Ryan McBride there. So a legend for Derry City. Died only 20, is 27. So this is a penultimate uh, headstone. This is up in Roselawn again, um, outside Belfast, and it commemorates Georgina, known as Ina McKeown. This is Ina McKeown here. She was born on 10th August 1917. In 1953, Ina McKeown became the first woman to win the, the best all-rounder cup travelled all over the world with her husband and her beloved bicycle. Ina broke the record for the time it took to cycle from Derry Post Office to Belfast Post Office in 1953. She had four hours to do it, did it in three hours and 46 minutes. The bicycle that she did, that she used to break that record is now in the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. As well as many sporting triumphs in her life, Ina survived the Ballymacart Railway disaster on 10th January 19. Um, 45, which claimed 19 lives. After the accident, the Ballymacart Railway disaster, Ina said she appreciated her life even more and credited cycling as a secret to a long life. She died on 29th March 2019, is 101 years and seven months. So this is her picture on her 100th birthday. So that's uh, Ina McKeown. So the last one then is up to Coleraine. Uh, and this is Harry Gregg. You might be able to see there's the Manchester United logo uh, on his headstone along with the Northern Ireland logo. And this is the photograph that's on Harry Gregg's headstone. He was born on 27th of October 1932. Who's a Northern Irish uh, professional footballer, goalkeeper, and manager? He played for Manchester United during the reign of Sir Matt Busby and made a total of 247 appearances for the club. He was also a survivor of the Munich Air disaster in 1958. He was more, much more than a survivor, actually, because he, he, was, uh, he, he, he was a real hero from that, uh, returning to the, to the burning uh, wreckage. To, uh, rescue teammates and also uh, passengers. So Harry Gregg also played for Doncaster Rovers in Stoke City, and he also made 25 appearances for the Northern Ireland national team between 1954 and 1963, uh, including an appearance at the 1958 World Cup. He later went into management with Carlisle United, Crew Alexander, Shrewsby Town and Swansea City, and he died relatively recently 16th February 2020, is 87. So that's Harry Gregg, the 20th and last of the headstones of sporting legends from Northern Ireland we'll be talking about tonight.
Thanks very much. Thanks very much. That was um, that was fantastic. I don't know if there's any um, questions coming in, but um, there's a comment here anyway from Liam Short of <coughs> just to say terrific work, Peter. Thank you. Never knew Paddy Main played rugby for Ireland and the Lions. Um, I think that's a, a big unknown to a lot of people. Uh, Stephen has great work. She or great job. She's was that was just brilliant as always, Peter. And uh, we'll certainly look forward to the next the next chapter for the next next talk that you, you think you're coming up with. Well, um, yeah, it's uh, it's great to be able to talk about these folks and maybe publicize you know the achievements of maybe folks who aren't uh, particularly well known like there's the obvious people like George Best Alex Higgins but I like telling the stories about Ina McKeown and Molly Seaton etc um so Charlie Tully as well so and then Ryan McBride and Cormac McNallan they're very sad stories and they died you know quite young so Have we lost Marianne, Liam? I think we might have, yeah. <laughs> her, her audio is gone. Are you there, Marianne? You're just on mute. I think we've lost her, Peter. I, I'll just wrap up just by saying thank you very much for a very informative lecture, as always. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Thank you Good very much, much Peter. Thanks, Liam.